Morning. 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 I uh, joked with my wife when we moved to Tennessee. I am a proud Colorado native. Um, we moved last year, so for the first 27 years of my life, I've lived right outside Denver. And I told my wife when we moved to Tennessee, my kids will not have a drawl. Um, <laughs> they will speak correctly the way that us Coloradans do, uh, not, not like those. And, you know, I love the people of the South, but there are some you just cannot understand. Um, <laughs> Anyway, by a show of hands, how many of you feel you got a robust education on sex in the church growing up? Anybody? And we're talking a church who willingly discussed the positives of sex, how to have a great sex life in your marriage. Anybody? No? I think for the most part, the church steers clear of these things, right? Um, really all things sexual. But if they do wade into the discussion... All you get to hear is what I call donut theology. Donut theology. Donut fornicate. Oh. Donut view pornography. Donut commit adultery. Donut be homosexual. Donut be transgender. The problem with this is that most people are starving. And, and for those who are starving, these donuts look really tasty. They look incredible, right? We want these, they're sweet. They're so good. They're, they would for sure satisfy my hunger, right? We don't really have the alternative, and so why would we not indulge in all these things that we're not supposed to indulge in? We're told, don't do this, don't do that. And when given commands like that, we have to ask a basic question. Why? Why would we not? So if we ask this question and answer it the way that, that people in the church typically answer it, what are we going to hear? You might get yourself or someone else pregnant, right? Don't fornicate because you might end up with a, with a pregnancy. You might contract an STD. You'll create sexual baggage. Don't look at porn because you might become addicted to child pornography or you'll contribute to the sex trafficking trade. Don't look at porn. Don't commit adultery because you'll get caught. Ruins families, right? Don't become homosexual or transgender because... You might die an early death. AIDS and, and various other diseases and issues, they don't have as long of a life expectancy. And ultimately, you'll go to hell. You'll go to hell. All of these things are true. Okay? All of these things, or, or at least have some truth to them. All these things are possible. So when we go tell people this, we're not wrong to tell them that. But here's the problem. Our fear tactics aren't working anymore. The kids of this generation and, and the world, they don't care. They don't care because here's the problem. As we look through all of these, I could look at the first two and go, well, condoms will salt that, right? If I'm thinking worldview, or, you know, from the world point of view, I would say, well, if I wear a condom, then no STDs. If I wear a condom, then, you know, I won't get anybody pregnant. So not a big deal. The sexual baggage, what are you talking about? That's, that's sexual conquering. I'm more sexually desirable when I had a dozen people sleep with me. That's, that's me on the top of the food chain, man. You might become addicted to child pornography. Please, the statistics on that are very low compared to those who look at pornography. So, you know, that, that may create fear, but I don't think that I'm, I'll, I'll enter into child pornography. For the sex trafficking, those aren't the porn sites I go to. Um, you know, the ones that, that I look at are models that... that are okay with this, and they're the ones that um, you know put themselves out there. This isn't sex trafficking. You'll get caught. Oh no, I know plenty of people who have had adulterous affairs who have not gotten caught, um, dying an early death. Hey, medications and treatments for medical issues associated with homosexuality and transgenderism are getting better all the time. So, you know, I know a couple of, of homosexuals in their 60s and 70s that are doing just great. You'll go to hell. I, I don't believe in hell. Right? I don't believe in hell. I can't help who I love. So we throw these things out there as though they're trump cards, and we say, don't do these things. Do not do this. Do not do that. Do not do this. Do not do that. And then when, when they go, well, why not? All we can point to is the negatives. All we can point to is all these bad things that will befall you, and the world is going, we have ways around that. That's not that big a deal. <laughs> This great Christopher Yuan quote is from his book, Holy Sexuality. A robust theology cannot be built on what we're not allowed to do. 
for the Christian life is more than the avoidance of sinful behavior. If scriptural prohibitions are the only lens through which we see things, then we may well miss the gospel. You know, those forbidden donuts may taste good for a time, but they're not going to satisfy. We must point them toward the meat and potatoes of the gospel, which will completely satisfy. So let's go back yet again. Let's ask the same question, but this time with the background, with, with the, the foundation of the meat and potatoes of the gospel, let's ask why. Why would we not do these things? Why should we view sex maybe in a positive way? Not with all these, these fear-mongering things. <clears throat> why would we do this? God created sex for a beautiful, beautiful reason. We don't need to use scare tactics. We don't need to manipulate statistics. We don't need to to point toward the, the fearful emotions or anything like that so as to keep people away from all of these things. The church simply needs to have their sexuality pointed back toward the creator. Our sexual purity before marriage matters because sex is God's beautiful design. Sexual fidelity in marriage matters because sex is God's beautiful design. Enjoying sex in marriage matters because sex is God's beautiful design. Our gender, our sexuality, seeing sexuality and gender as sacred matters because sex is God's beautiful design. It's His. It's not ours. The world has taken it and and has decided sexuality is theirs. They didn't design it. They didn't create it. They've warped it. And we've allowed them to while we've been silent about it. We've allowed them to take what is rightfully God's and destroy it while we've been silent. So why did he design it? And and this is the question. I mean, when I do premarital counseling with people, I always ask them, what's the purpose for sex? Why did God design sex? Other than procreation, they have no answers. I'm telling you, every single one of them, we always come to that point in, in premarital counseling. So why did he design it? I don't know. To have kids. So then why did he make it so pleasurable? Why did, why did he give us Song of Solomon showing it's a very beautiful and pleasurable thing where kids really don't enter into the picture of Song of Solomon at all? So why did he design it? To be honest, this is the crux of the issue right here. We don't know in the church. We know why we should avoid all those things. The donut theology, right? Do not do those things. We know why we should avoid them, but we don't know what we're running to. And it's so much more powerful to run towards something instead of away from something. Amen. We've known that for years, and we do nothing about it when it comes to sex. We don't know what we're running towards, so we run in circles. And the church does the same thing as the world. And then we wonder why there's so much sexual brokenness in the church, and we stay silent about it. Because we don't know what we're running toward. It's time we change that. It's time we start understanding that biblical truth, or bibl- the biblical text points to a simple truth. Sex is the pinnacle of intimacy. Why did God design sex? He designed it as the pinnacle of intimacy. Some people equate sex with intimacy, right? They say, well, be be intimate with your spouse. Well, I was, uh, you know, we engaged in some intimacy. And I really don't like that because it it takes away from, from the beauty of the term intimacy and we make it all about sex. Intimacy is not all about sex. As a matter of fact, I, I think it can be defined in a few different ways. In the therapy world, we, we define it as vulnerability plus authenticity. This comes from the, the Tinsa book, Trauma-Induced Sexual Addiction, which I use in my private practice. And the idea here is just as it sounds. To be open with somebody, but to be real about it. We can feign or fake openness. Can we not? Mm. I'm vulnerable with my sins. And, and I know people, I know preachers who have preached from the pulpit about their sins, come to find out they had a ton of, it was, it was all fake. It's all fake. This is vulnerability plus authenticity. We've got to be real, but we've got to be open. We've got to be vulnerable with people. That's that's one way of of seeing intimacy. This is why we call sexual addiction an intimacy disorder. Um, We don't know how to be intimate. And we'll look at that a little more later. I once heard a guy was actually on a plane, um, got to talking with a fellow and and was explaining. He was on a plane here, believe it or not, last year. And... um, Come to find out, this guy was a pastor at a church in Chicago and, and did a ministry, like an intimacy ministry. Couldn't believe it. What are the odds that I'd run into this guy on a plane? And he gave me this one. Into me you see. 
Uh, I thought that was pretty good. What is intimacy? Into me you see. And the way I've always defined intimacy is to know and be known. To know and be known. The idea behind all of these is to be transparent, to be open, to be real, and to let people see inside of us. But I also think to know is important, not just to be known on that level. Intimacy, true intimacy, is to know others on that level. And for them in a marriage, for your spouse, to be just as open and to be just as known on every single level. And us allowing ourselves to feel that. From the very beginning, God created us as beings who needed intimacy. What's the first thing in the Bible that God says is not good? For man to be alone. It's not good for man to be alone. Everything else was good. It was very good, right? And the first thing he says is it's not good for man to be alone. I find that to be highly, highly significant for biblical texts. Man needed someone who was on his level. Adam clearly is not on God's level, right? Animals clearly aren't on Adam's level. So Adam is, is virtually alone. Who, is, who knows Adam on the deepest of levels? Nobody. So God has to create somebody. He takes a helper from the rib, as we often talk about, right from the side. Not from the head, so as to rule, not from the heel, so him to rule over, but from the side. Right, to be a partner, to be a helper, a helpmeet for him. Someone who could provide Adam with just a taste of what God shared in the Godhead. Unity through intimacy. So what do I mean when I say sex is the pinnacle of intimacy? This is what I call the intimacy pyramid here. These are the different domains of life. You can think of it as pies, physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual. And the idea of, of this entire pyramid is that intimacy builds from the bottom up. Sex at the top, the physical, is, is the peak. It feels the best. It's amazing. But if we invert this and try to put sex as intimacy, and we try to cure our issues in marriage through sex, it's wobbly, right? Right. It falls down. It will never stand up because we're putting sex first. When you're open on every single level, spiritually, with all your sins, all your struggles, your spouse knows you. They know your spiritual struggles. On an emotional level, your spouse knows your emotions, your hurts, your fears, your concerns, your excitements, your victories. They know all that about you. You know theirs. Intellectual, you know their friends. You are a friend to them. You know their hobbies, their likes, their dislikes, their their hopes, their dreams, their goals, their interests. You care about them on an intellectual level. When you are taking care of intimacy on every single level, those three bottom ones, sex is natural. Intimacy in marriage um, starts from the bottom, and the physical intimacy we feel in sex is just a natural outflowing of a life lived in intimacy. Where we see problems in marriage is where people put physical first, or they even put emotional first. They have spiritual struggles, but they don't know it about each other. They don't pray together. They don't study God's word together. They don't hardly participate in anything spiritual together, and they think somehow they're going to have intimacy. You can't. Intimacy has to be built, built from the bottom up with this pyramid. And, and the great thing about this is, For those who are single and they say, well, I can't have sexual intimacy. These three bottom ones are for you. What can you, on on these three bottom ones, spiritual, emotional, and intellectual, can you not as a single person experience those with somebody else? This is why accountability is so important. When I work with porn addicts and I, I push them toward accountability, the accountability has to be right. It's not just, hey, did you fall this week? Uh, Yeah, I did. Okay, praying for you, brother. I'll see you next week. That's not accountability, and yet that's most of what accountability partners are. That's horrible. Accountability is about creating the spiritual, emotional, and intellectual intimacy that you can't have, you don't, you're not looking for sex in that relationship, but you are looking for intimacy because we're all in need of intimacy, and and even singles can experience it on that level. And you know what? If you practice that in your relationship with your, with your, you know, girlfriend and then fiance, The sex will be a natural outflowing. It's going to be amazing in marriage because you've built the foundation of intimacy. Sex is best when a couple has prioritized intimacy on every single level. On that spiritual, on the emotional, on the intellectual. And the physical doesn't always have to be sex. The physical could be a kiss, holding hands, a long, a prolonged hug. It's a natural outflowing of somebody who is, is close. I want to be close to this person. I want to put into this person as much as I possibly can in a selfless level. I want them to see me for me, and I want to see them for them. 
And we can only do that when we're open on each of these levels. So if you're struggling in your relationship sexually, I point to this just as much and I say, okay, sex is never just about sex. When I'm working with couples and when I work with these guys who come to me and they say, you know, the, the sex is horrible in our marriage, how can I fix the sex? I say, forget about that. Let's talk about the intellectual, the emotional, or, or really most of the time the spiritual. What are you doing in your relationship to help those? Well, nine times out of ten, the spiritual or the emotional are seriously suffering. The friendship, most people are okay with the friendship side of it. Um, the intellectual is, is not as big of a deal, which is why it's the second. It's important, but the be- bedrock, the foundation, when I work with couples is you got a spiritual intimacy problem or an emotional intimacy problem. Do you know what your spouse is going through at work? Do you know your spouse's innermost desires, innermost emotions, the things that drive them nuts about you? Is there trust in the relationship that your spouse can come to you with their emotional issues and say, I'm really struggling that you do X, Y, or Z. It's hurting my feelings. Is there trust in the relationship that it's not going to blow up into a huge fight? It's, it'll be handled in a way of, I hear you. I accept that. Let's talk about it. Let's work through it. If you don't have that, your sex will never be as good as it could be. There's no trust there. There, And and without trust, there's no intimacy. So the intimacy of sex is, is amazing when it's done correctly on the other levels. And until that's done, the sex will continue to struggle. So how do these things connect to the gospel? We talk about, you know, God's design for sexuality. This is, again, kind of my design, the the. Um, intimacy pyramid, and you'll find different ones online and such, and it's one that I've worked with for a while. How does this connect to the gospel? First, marriage is intended as a shadow of true intimacy between us and God. Man's deepest need is to be known and accepted by our creator. Sex is our way to replicate on earth our being fully naked and known, something we will truly experience in heaven. <laughs> Let me read that one more time, just because there's, there's a little bit to take in there. Marriage is intended as a shadow of true intimacy between us and God. Man's deepest desire, and that should, should be need, is to be known and accepted by our Creator. Sex is our way to replicate on earth our being fully naked and known, something we will truly experience in heaven. Consider the end of Genesis 2. The man explains the covenant of marriage. He places a huge importance on the creation of women, right? And we see in verse 24, it says, For this reason, which of course, for this reason, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman because she was taken out of man. Because she was taken out of man, because she's bone of my bone, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. And they shall become one flesh. What is that joining in the becoming one flesh? There's a lot of things that go into that, but sex is a big part of that. It's a big part of being joined to somebody. Of becoming one flesh. But notice the next phrase in verse 25. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, why is that important right here? Why would he say they were both naked and unashamed? What's the importance? What's the significance in that, in, in that passage, in that place? Because nakedness signals a key point. Innocence and vulnerability. <laughs> Innocence and vulnerability. God created man to be perfect, and this is how he made us. Innocent and vulnerable. Sex in the confines of marriage between two completely intimate people on every level of that pyramid takes us back to the garden. Takes us back to when creation was beautiful, when creation was perfect. You're innocent and you're vulnerable with each other. In each other's sight, we're naked and we're not ashamed about it. You see me for me. And once again, this is nakedness on every level. Yes, the physical nakedness. They were physically naked. But they also, we see right after the fall, what do they do? They cover themselves up with leaves. So they they lose that physical nakedness, but they're also blaming each other. They're also hiding from the presence of God. There's There's a spiritual separation. They lost spiritual intimacy with God. And then they blame each other, or or rather Adam blames Eve, loses the emotional intimacy right after this. Right? So Sin enters the picture. Eve, you know, Adam, Adam should have been there, and, and Adam and Eve stumble. And boom, shame enters the picture, and they no longer want to be naked. When we're in a covenantal relationship, and we have sex with our spouse, it brings us back to the garden. It brings us back to the beauty of the way God created it. Innocent, 
and vulnerable and unashamed. It allows us to cherish each other's innocence and vulnerability in a way unlike any other. It's a selfless act of love where we take care of what the other person has willingly given us. They've willingly offered themselves to us, and we willingly take. Not in a transactional, you know, or, or even a, a trying to get one up or a power struggle. That's not what sex is all about. That's what so much, that's, that's what sex becomes for so many people. It's just a power struggle. Sex is intended to be selfless. Sex is intended to be innocent. It's intended to be vulnerable. We take care of what the other person has willingly given us. Second, our sexual desire is to be fulfilled only in a covenant relationship, which is marriage. Sex draws us more deeply into a covenant love with each other, which is a representation of the covenant love between Christ and his church. And we see that in Ephesians 5. The parallels between marriage, between a man and a woman, and Christ and the church. The covenant matters because you'll never fully be intimate with somebody who could leave you tomorrow. You will never open yourself up to somebody in that way. Intimacy is built on trust in the relationship, and the trust comes from a covenant that was made before God. I think this is why God hates divorce, to be honest. It cuts away at the trust and the foundation of covenant. When I know that, you know, before marriage, my girlfriend or, or you know, my fiance or whatever could leave me. There's been no covenant. And when I know that when I get into marriage, divorce could happen in a year, well, there's also no intimacy. There's, there's no covenant there. There's no deeper, like, there's no trust. There's no trust. Why would I open myself up to somebody who's just going to, you know, she could sign the papers and divorce me in a month. Why would I not? Divorce has eaten away at this idea of intimacy and this idea of, of covenant in our culture. And unfortunately, too many Christians get involved in this as well. God hates divorce. And we go, well, says he hates divorce, but, you know, we, we see that in Matthew 19 and there's other places where divorce is accepted and allowed and, you know, yes, for the hardness of heart, but we still, why do we accept this in the church? Why is it okay? Why do we, when there has been infidelity, too often, in my opinion, couples immediately run to sign the divorce papers. I work in this for a living. I work for, a, I, I do a, uh, work with a program called Boulder Recovery. It's a two-week sexual addiction place. And it's amazing for these people that, that aren't even Christians, their wives stick with them. And these guys have been with prostitutes. These guys have been with to massage parlors that cheated on them multiple times. And these women say, you know what, if you can get yourself help, I'll stick around. As bad as that is of what they're doing, they believe in the covenant of marriage. And these people aren't even Christians. Why aren't Christians leading that? Why aren't Christians the ones that are showing the covenant of marriage matters? No matter what we stick around. We don't divorce because it's eating away at this. But with Christ in the church, when it comes to that, Jesus cleanses his bride and he sees us at our most intimate. He chooses to love us at our most vulnerable. He cherishes us. And I believe he asks us to be naked and unashamed when we come to him. Amen. I think that's what 1 John 1 is about. Walking in the light as he is in the light. Walking in the light is don't be a good person. Walking in the light is let him see you for you. Be open with your sins, confessing our sins to each other, being completely transparent, allowing the light of Christ to shine on us. That's what we're looking for, is to be naked and unashamed when we come to Christ, because he has cleansed us, because he has cherished us. This is what sex brings. And third, when we honor sex and use it as it is intended, we show the world a deeper unity and intimacy than they can fathom. We must then point them to true unity and intimacy with Christ, who knows them on the deepest level. I'll read that one more time. When we honor sex and use it as it is intended, we show the world a deeper unity and intimacy than they can fathom. We must then point them to true unity and intimacy with Christ, who knows them on the deepest level. The world thinks sex is about personal gratification. They have no idea the spiritual implications behind it. But they also have no idea how to know and be known how to be vulnerable and authentic. The world does not understand that. And unfortunately, there are many in the church who struggle with that as well. There are way too many couples who struggle sexually due to the woman hating sex, due to the guy wanting sex 24-7 because he's constantly unfulfilled, which causes his wife to feel like she's withholding, and she feels like a piece of meat, and, and he feels like she is, is you know, 
blowing 1 Corinthians 7 out of the water and, and not sticking to that. He's staying bitter about it. They're both just looking to gratify their own needs in every way. And this happens in the church all the time. We have no theology on sex. We don't understand what it's about. And so couples struggle, and, and because they struggle, and yet the church refuses to talk about it, they stay in their struggle. So you have husband and wife after husband and wife after husband and wife who their sex is terrible, but they put up with it because what's the alternative? So they'll read a few books and maybe they'll go to a weekend to remember or something conference, you know, um, trying to fix the sexual where hopefully they can be around people who finally will listen to their sexual struggles because we don't talk about them in the church. We don't talk to each other about that. Why would we? It's, it's taboo, right? Now, you could look to the world and, and, you know, go to a worldly therapist, watch porn with your spouse, you know, spice it up in the bedroom, because that's what's going to help. And that's the greatest advice that, that couples can get sometimes, right? That's horrible. That's horrible advice. And yet, where else are they supposed to turn? Because we are silent on it in the church. Sex as God intended allows our spouse to see us at our most vulnerable, warts and all, and still choose to give themselves to us. Nothing feels better than to be fully known and to be fully accepted. The world and many in the church don't understand this at all. They cannot understand this, of what it's like to be fully known and fully accepted. I'm, I can't tell my spouse of my secret sin or even my past sin. I can't tell my spouse of how I truly feel about X, Y, or Z. We have all the jokes of like, can you tell your wife that you know the dress makes her look fat? Like, I don't have a problem with that in my marriage because my wife knows I love her to death and I don't think that about her. I can be fully open about everything in my marriage, what I think. If I think that you know she did something wrong or she thinks I did something wrong, we'll talk about it. We have a 15-minute rule in our marriage. If I'm thinking about it 15 minutes later, we will talk about it because I don't want there to be any bitterness. I don't want that to rise in the marriage. That's how we create intimacy is to talk all the time about everything, whether, it's a, whether I was incredibly offended or not, let's talk about it. We have to. So as to preserve our sexual parts in our marriage as well. As we begin to discuss sex more, we must teach people of their underlying need that drives them to desire sex, which is intimacy. Sex is not about physical gratification, as we've already said. I work with sex addicts. Um, we call sex addiction an intimacy disorder for a reason. Because when you're in sex addiction, the shame keeps you from feeling like you can be close to people. But so often, sex addiction is caused by trauma. Trauma turns connectors into protectors. The things that would cause me to, to connect to somebody, and now I, I, I protect myself from that. And so they don't know how to have real relationships. They don't know how to connect with people on a deep, intimate level. And Sex addiction is just the, the natural outflowing of that. So when we work with them on allowing people in, we process the trauma, and we work on, the, on turning those protectors back into connectors, the sex addiction goes away. Because the sex addiction and, and the, the, this deep desire for sex, these guys going to you know, dozens of prostitutes, they're trying to replicate something that cannot be replicated in that way. They deeply want to be known intimately and they don't know how, and they're scared to. They're protective of themselves. They have protective parts inside of them that keeps them from feeling that. So they act out sexually. That's why we call it an intimacy disorder. It was not good for man to be alone 6,000 years ago. It's still not good for man to be alone. We are intended to be known. We all have a deep, inherent need to know and be known. I believe this is what heaven's all about. To be in the presence of God, knowing Him and being fully known by Him. This is what sex points us to. Sex and the gospel go hand in hand. They go together. Because sex is, is a couple's way of being intimate, of knowing each other, which is, again, ultimately what we want with us and God. It is a beautiful picture of what took place in the garden, of God giving us something enjoyable, giving us something that, yes, it cre it's, it's procreation, but what could be better out of intimacy than to be able to raise kids together, to have the joy of human life come into the world because we love each other, because we've been intimate with each other. To me, that's why children are a blessing. It's, procreation is very important in when you're trying to start the world, no doubt. Procreation is still very important, though, because it's a way for two, couples who, or for two people who love each other 
to come together and to create life out of that or have God create life through that. And when they continue to be intimate in their relationship in every single way, they grow up as, most of the time, very solid parents because their relationship is solid. Their relationship is, has a solid foundation upon which they can build their parenting. Sex is beautiful. Sex is holy. And sex is designed for a reason. Our intimacy, and it's pointing to Christ in the church, is the meat and potatoes that we'll fulfill. Sex is there for a reason. So we can, we can change that donut theology and the meat and potatoes theology, right? We say, donut fornicate. Pursue covenant first. Amen. Why don't we fornicate? Sex won't, that, that sex will not fulfill. Once again, how can you reach full intimacy with somebody who's going to leave you tomorrow? You can't. You can't. It's impossible. There's no covenant relationship drawing you into one another. It is merely physical gratification that will leave you empty and unfulfilled. The meat and potatoes here is to pursue covenant first. Get in a covenantial relationship with this woman, with this man. Pursue a trust and a depth of relationship, and then the sex will feel amazing. But the sex will never fulfill. It'll be the same as, as it always is, which is we want sex every single day because it's, it's not giving us what we need. I actually have a theory that those who are most intimate in their covenantial marriage relationship, those who are most emotionally and spiritually taken, connect, uh, taken care of, actually have less sex. And those who need sex every day, well, that tells me there's something wrong in the marriage. Always want it. I always need it. I, I need it. You know, 24-7 we go, well, that's guys being guys. As, you know, we're just created that way. No, no, no. No. We weren't created to be, I hate to say it, but animals who need sex 24-7. Sex was for a very specific reason. And when I have guys tell me that, I go, okay, tell me about the rest of your life. Do you feel taken care of emotionally? And most of the guys who want sex all the time go, what does that mean? And we have to talk about what that actually means to be taken care of emotionally, to be taken care of spiritually. There is a problem when you want sex 24-7. You are not being fulfilled on an intimate level, an intimacy level. So we have to figure out that first. And, and once again, this happens in fornication. The sex is simply not fulfilling. Well, don't, you know, don't view pornography. Why would we not do that? Because that fills us with shame. That robs us of the ability to feel close to people. We're never going to allow people to know us, and we can't fully know others when we're in the throes of porn addiction. And when we're constantly looking at porn, or even occasionally looking at porn. It makes us feel perverted. It makes us feel all sorts of things, which is, is a different discussion for a different time. I don't believe in shaming, and we'll get into some of this tomorrow. Um, guilt, yes. Guilt that drives us back to God. Shame, which drives us inward. We don't do. But this takes away from our very ability to connect with others and God. Once again, that's why we call it intimacy disorder. We cannot connect. So pursue vulnerable connection. Allow people to see you for who you are. Instead of telling us, well, you might end up in child pornography, why don't we say, pursue what you actually need? When I work with porn addicts, I say, you know, when you're driven toward porn, a lot of times we go, well, just get busy. Just get busy. Just go fill your mind with something else, and that will help. And yet, they do that for a couple hours. They do that for a couple days, and eventually they fall, right? Because they didn't actually meet the need. The need is not porn. The need in that could be relationship. It could be connection. It could, be, it could just be sleep. It could be you know, taking care of the stressors or whatever that, that you're running to porn for. You run to porn for a reason. And most people go, well, just forget about it and try to push it to the side. That doesn't work. You need to dig deep and understand why am I actually doing this? Why am I actually going to porn? What am I trying to fix? What, what void am I trying to fill? Nine times out of ten, it's going to be connection. What you really need is to be known. What you really need is relationship. You really need to get on the phone with somebody and talk to somebody about what's going on in your lives, uh, in your life, the stressors, the emotions, the things that, that, are, that you're struggling with in the moment. So why don't we look at pouring the meat and potatoes? Pursue valuable and, and vulnerable connection with other people. Do not commit adultery. Why do we not commit adultery? Is it just because we might get caught? 
It's because how can you be intimate with someone when you're destroying intimacy on the very base level, spiritually? How could you possibly begin to feel close to that person when you're in sin? Infidelity completely robs us of true intimacy in our marriage, but also, more importantly, in our relationship with God. You cannot be vulnerable and and authentic with God when you're in the middle of, of committing adultery. It robs us of that completely. You can't be naked in the eyes of God when you're in sin. Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves up immediately. And so you're spending your life in the shadows. You're spending your life trying to cover yourself with fig leaves and hiding from the presence of God. And you think that that sex is going to fulfill? You think because it's, you know, who it's, it's, it's hot, it's new, it's whatever else, that that's going to fulfill? It's horrifying. The main potatoes is to pursue spiritual intimacy, the base level. And you cannot be spiritually intimate when you're in throes of sin. Pursue spiritual intimacy in your relationships, in every relationship, but also in your marriage. Those who are, are running to somebody else, so often we call them emotional affairs is how they start. But I would, I would specifically say they jump to the emotion because their spirituality is not taken care of. Pursue spiritual intimacy with everybody. Yes, with your spouse, but with everybody. Be open about your sin. Confess your sins one to another. Actually fulfill the scripture that is telling us Confess your sins one to another. We don't do that either, which is a different, different discussion for a different time. But when you pursue spiritual intimacy in your relationships, you are known on a deep level. There's no room for, for these emotional affairs. There's no room for physical affairs because you're known on, on the level that you need the most. And then you start working on the emotions on up. Why don't we turn toward homosexuality or transgenderism? Same answer as with the adultery. I mean, you're in sin. So... Obviously, there's that. But also, we'll then miss out on God's plan for us that he's laid out for our gender. The mean potatoes is to pursue God's perfect plan. We may not understand that, and, and we'll get into a little bit of this tomorrow, but we may not understand why we have desires for same-sex attraction or, or you know, whatever it may be, why we struggle with gender dysphoria. We may not fully understand that. God has a reason. God had a reason why I struggled with pornography for a decade. There was a reason for it. Why he allowed this. There's a reason why he allows us to sometimes struggle with the things that we know we're not supposed to do. God has a perfect plan for your life. God did not mess up with our gender. That's right. And us trying to change that is, is going against God's perfect plan. Pursue that. What does that mean in your life? How can, had, can your struggle in a, in a 2 Corinthians 11 way... How can God take your struggle and use it for his glory? With transgenderism and homosexuality, that is a beautiful way. The, the struggles there is a beautiful way to allow God to take that, to allow God to, you know, for Christ to get the glory and him helping you out of that. Pursue God's perfect plan. God created sex for a reason, and that's to be the pinnacle of intimacy. Let's strive to be people who pursue intimacy in, in our lives with others, with our spouse, Definitely, and most importantly, with God. Let's be intimate, vulnerable, authentic people. Great sex, I'm convinced, starts in every relationship, not just in the marriage, not just in the bedroom. We, keep, we, we back it up and back it up and back it up. We say, well, it starts at nighttime. Or it starts in the bedroom. It starts in the home. It starts in the, you know, whatever it may be. In the relationship, it starts in how you and I connect. Am I living my life in a vulnerable and authentic way with everybody? If I got secret sin I'm hiding from everybody, if I've got, you know, these these pent up emotions that I'm not talking about to anybody, that will affect everything. But specifically in our marriage, are we being authentic and vulnerable? Are we knowing and and being known by our spouse? Do we want that? And if you don't want to be known, what I would say is from a from a clinical perspective, you probably have some traumas that have turned your connectors into protectors. Deal with it. Get yourself some help. Get yourself some therapy if you feel that I can't allow people in. Or if we believe those core negative beliefs of, you know, I deserve bad things or, or if people knew the real me, they would reject me or I'm a bad person. Um, also get yourself some help. There's therapy for that. Um, those things are very, very difficult, but those also will rob us of the ability to pursue intimacy. So if you'd like to talk more about this, um, please come up after. Uh, if we don't get a chance to connect here, I've, I've left a few business cards over there. Uh, feel free to call me anytime. 
this is my life. I, I, again, as a therapist, I specialize in sex addiction. Um, I am more than happy to talk about it. This is, I'm very passionate about it, as I mentioned. Being a porn addict for 10 years, it gives you a different perspective. It gives you a different appreciation for those dealing with sexual issues. Um, now that I deal with it you know, for a living and I work with guys that have literally done and experienced everything on the sexual spectrum, um, you realize people are broken and everybody is broken in some way sexually. Everybody has been affected by sexual brokenness or they had their lives, whether it be a kid who turned out homosexual or, or you know, they uh, experienced fornication or they have porn addiction or they have same-sex attraction or they're asexual. They don't, they don't understand how to have sex. Um, everybody is, is affected in some way by these struggles. If you're one of them um, and you'd like to talk more, absolutely, I'd love to. Um, I also provide a seminar on porn addiction, and I'm working on building one specifically for just sexuality in general and dealing with these things, but um, if your church might be interested. But again, hopefully, um, I'll see you guys tomorrow. We're going to talk about how the church can better handle these things. The biggest, the, the base part of that is we have to know what we're running to. We have to know that sex is a beautiful design of God's, and that when it's done appropriately, it draws us back toward Him. It draws us back toward the intimacy that Christ has with the church, that God has with the Godhead. Unity, vulnerability, authenticity. That's what sex allows us to have. It allows us to, and when we pursue that in a relationship in every way, the sex is incredible, and I think it's a huge gift of God's, that he has created it to be so enjoyable for that reason. When we are most open and naked with our spouse in a covenant relationship. So, um, again, love to talk after, but I really appreciate your time. Thank you.